there Rachel O'Sullivan is with us Kathleen is here as well you're both very welcome are we going to start in Gotham is that the best place yeah can do very very interesting story with them um, obviously came last in the league last year had one of the worst records in NWSL history and then came out and kind of stunned everyone this year probably the best story out of it is Ali Krieger finishing up her US career and her professional playing career she kind of joked with Megan Rapino, who also finished up at the weekend well, about when would her last game be when she first announced it because obviously you don't know what the playoffs when you're going to go off and she, uh, Megan Rapino, posted a screenshot of a text message and she was like November 11th and she was very true what, and it all happened for her but uh, yeah she has been such a good loyal servant to US football for so long and just one of those nice success stories like you know it would have been great for Rapino, obviously to go out on a high but I think uh, Krieger going out on a high is probably the next best thing uh, no sign of Sinead Farley stopping again. Is there? There's no possibility that she's going to ride. I'm going to ride off into the sunset here. No, I don't think so. Um, I know there was a bit of worry earlier on in the year when she missed that international break after the World Cup, but uh, she came back for the last few. Seems happy out. Obviously, great news for her getting that win over the weekend. It's again another great redemption story. I think that was kind of the thing with. Gotham over the weekend there were so many good individual stories that it was very easy to get behind them and then obviously the game itself was quite entertaining too um, Rachel just put some context on Sinead Farley's achievement for us will you oh can you hear us Rachel yes I can just now yeah sorry I'm just I'm I just wondering could you put some context on the achievement of Sinead Farrelly in uh, securing a place on the Gotham team that wins the league and, um, you know, coming back and just being an important character for us into the future as well. It's a real, I don't want to use the word fairy tale, but it's a real full circle story after everything that she's gone through over there. Um, to then go and, and lift the trophy uh, is, is a pretty special moment. I think, you know, she obviously left football for a while um, and, and didn't think she'd come back to it. So to not only come back, to make the national team, to make a World Cup, to then win it is uh, is pretty incredible. It's it's a kind of storybook type of type of thing. Uh, we do expect her to play. I'm, I was being mildly Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, like, yeah. I think she should be coming back. There's no reason why she wouldn't um, unless it's a case where obviously coming to the end of her season and having to go straight into the middle of it after the World Cup maybe like there might be a choice there somewhere where they decide to give her a bit of a break but that would be the only reason like there'd be nothing else behind it okay uh, to talk about Katie McKay go on sorry I'm sorry I, ju I just had one last one on, on Gotham Rachel I is there one single thing that's been mentioned as the reason why this spectacular turnaround has happened or or, or what's the, the, the go-to anecdote that's been used in the aftermath of their success on at the weekend as to as to why they've managed to turn this thing around? Um, I don't think there's one particular thing, um, to be honest. You know, it's always an unusual when you see a team that didn't necessarily, like, top the the league to then win it. Um, I think it is always special when you're playing, when you've got another extra level to it, that being Krieger leaving as well. Um, I know both teams had someone leaving. Megan Rapino was also finishing her career, but I do think that gives a team extra fight. Um, I know Rapino obviously got injured early on, uh, very early on in the game, but you know, I, it's it just felt like there was all the pieces fell into place for them as as the games went on, um, and maybe that that final piece was was playing for somebody annoying. It was their last um, game because there seemed to be a lot of emotion around the the fixture, and and particularly at the end, um, it was very nice to see. It's also like a, a league that just has nailed the parity so well. When you look at the difference, I hadn't quite realised that seven points separating first and eighth. It's mm -hmm. uh, pretty incredible. Like I know, I know that we often marvel in US sports and the, the draft system and, and all their sports as to, to how well they do it, but the NWSL <laughs> has really nailed it. They have this phrase for the NWSL, it's like NWSL after dark, and it's basically that it just gets really, really chaotic, especially with the late evening games. And I feel like the final summed that up perfectly well it, between like Rapino going off three minutes in, the goalkeeping situation, having all these like massive US stars there at the end to see off Grieger. It's, uh, again, as Rachel was saying, because with US sports, you can have this whole situation where one team wins the league, but that's just the regular season, and then you go into the playoffs, you get all these way more interesting stories. Like there was even one of the players after the game, one of the Gotham players who was celebrating by playing a game of chess on the pitch. <laughs> like it's just, it's so random. And part of it is like very American, I think, or something where you just You've don't got, know. 
one of the celebration photos, she's got the trophies and like a cigar in her mouth as well, like puffing yeah. on a cigar. I'm like, you just you never see that in the WSL. Can you imagine? Yeah. It's the same with like the WNBA and the NBA. You know, you see them there with their cigars and like all the big rings and stuff and they kind of lead into that. And I, I think it's kind of funny seeing the fact that the women's teams have taken up that kind of men's history inside of celebrating as well. You sure Karen Duggan didn't have a cigar on Saturday night? Uh, I, I, she definitely had some fun from what I heard. <laughs> uh, no no cigar photos though that I saw. Uh, a 6-1 win in front of the cameras to wrap up the season is a good way for them to pick up the trophy? Oh, a very good way for them to pick up the trophy. I mean, I know you guys had James on last week and stuff when I was off, but I think that they you could see in the celebrations when the game ended just how delighted everyone was and they really felt like it was as Rachel was saying kind of earlier with Gotham and Sinead Farley, a full circle sort of moment when so many people had written them off. I think it was important for them as well to go out and actually hammer Slagger Rovers in the way they did. I did text Karen. I was like, you've already won the league. Like, you don't need to do that to me as well. <laughs> in this case, this is one of those rare instances where literally everybody did write a team off and they, they come back and win. It's not one of those made up like, oh, everyone's writing us off. Nobody wrote off. Everybody wrote them off. Yeah, no, literally everyone did write them off. And I think it's been really interesting listening to Karen over the year and, you know, I we always used to jo joke on Koi Gig that she'd be really grumpy on a Monday when she came in and they hadn't won or she hadn't played well or something. I don't think I've ever seen her as tense and nervous for the majority of the season as I did this year. But you could also see the creeping confidence as the season went on that she knew they were going to do it, but she was didn't want to say it because saying it would probably make it not happen, you know, that sort of way. Um, so yeah, delighted for them. They seem to really enjoy the celebrations. She's taken a rest from Koi Gig this week to properly enjoy the celebrations. So. All right, wow. <laughs> uh, a lost voice. Um, let's talk about uh, Katie McCabe and Arsenal. Um, I, I thought Arsenal were having a tricky season. I thought they were going to be, I think they were going to be very difficult for them. And now all of a sudden, they're second in the table. Even within games, they seem to be a, a little bit Jekyll and Hyde at the moment. By how things have changed. Um, I think it kind of summed up their season, that first half and that second half. Um, and again, look, it just shows how close the league is at the moment to be able to go from what were they were sixth all the way up to second just with one day of matches. Um, first half, they were awful, really. I mean, there has to be credit to, to Leicester as well, I think. Um, the way tactically that Willie Kirk had set the team up they were managing, Katie McCabe was playing on the right-hand side and she was struggling a little bit, I think. Anytime uh, Lester came forward and Hannah Kane attacked, um, she inverted on, on Katie McCabe and Katie was finding herself having to twist in her body and get round to try and, um, you know, impact the, the forward run. And yeah, they struggled and, and Lester were very, very clinical. Um, and two goals in two or three minutes. It was pretty incredible to watch and going in 2-0 at halftime, you thought, God, Ireland ha uh, Arsenal have a mighty fight on their hands. Um, and yeah, they came out and fought it. They they had three, four goals in I think 15 minutes. It was absolutely ridiculous. Every time they came forward, um, they scored and they went direct. I think we're so used to seeing Arsenal going wide, sending in the crosses, going wide, sending in the crosses and it coming to nothing. They were going direct and slicing right through um, that Leicester back line uh, and seemed to score every time they came forward. And, and to be fair, they were very unlucky. I think they created 24 chances, 12 on target uh, and six goals. So they were unlucky <clears throat> not to get more. Yeah, it was a bit of a remarkable game. I mean, after that first half, I was like, this is just very classic Arsenal. And I thought they'd come back into it and score a couple of goals. I wasn't expecting that complete turnaround, but I think it was as much Arsenal going direct as like Leicester's defence just crumbling, which is unfortunate to see because they've had a relatively good start to the season, especially considering how they played last season. And I'd love to see them because I think Leicester are a really interesting team and they're building an interesting like academy system and just general bits and bobs that they're doing in and around the club is really interesting. And there's a lot of really good young players there. So they're the sort of team that I'd love to see do well, but I did start to worry that as the season would go on, they would suffer these sort of collapses against teams. So hopefully this is just a blip for them and it doesn't go on. Um, because, yeah, I think uh, the league could do with a team like them doing well for the season. Uh, the Arsenal performance, I mean, we I think we did expect them to be proper title contenders, but they're on a run of form at the moment that suggests they're going to be able to get their way out of any trickiness and they're only three points behind Chelsea it's a long grinding season See, the yeah. is, in the WSL it's not that long as well though because there aren't that many teams so 
you know, results matter. You look at like the city result at the weekend, everyone was tipping them as being, you know, the best team in the league and super in form. But one result does send your season fairly sideways. And even though it is relatively early on, there still is quite a bit of emphasis on the fact that, I don't know, especially with Arsenal as well, I'm like, they've been so chaotic this season, it's hard to trust that they're going to be able to grind it out. for. That's the, the case if you expect Chelsea to basically win every game, right? Mm. And is that what you, is that the, the point? Well, I think Chelsea have the added fire this season as well as knowing that it's Emma Hayes last season and they're going to, they're definitely not the Chelsea that they were and I think that they're, like we saw in last season, they ground out a few ugly wins and that's what ended up getting them over the line but I do wonder if now that they have the Emma Hayes situation is that going to give them enough that they can get to the end of the season and they'll be fine but then maybe next season we won't see them being the kind of cohesive machine that we're used to Agreed I just I think Chelsea they're not playing their best but they're winning That that's all that matters to Emma Hayes at the moment I think with Arsenal as well it's it's they need to be beating the teams they should be beating or that they're expecting to beat. And that's where things maybe have derailed a little bit at the beginning of the season where they would expect to have beaten Liverpool. Um, you know, I think getting the draw at Man United was a was an okay result. Like, that wouldn't have been so catastrophic. But I think that someone was asking Mark Skinner about this um, uh, pre-match, about the games that they need to be winning, where a draw here and there, where they expect to have taken three points, could potentially derail your your title hopes. Um, and I think this season, as we keep saying, every year it's closer and closer. It is closer this season. Maybe, you know, in the past, a team, you lose two matches, you're not going to win the league. That's not really the case anymore. Um, although I do think United and Chelsea, I think both remaining unbeaten um, makes things exciting. But United unbeaten, they're still in third, I think. So um, it, it just, it is tighter. But as, as Kathleen says, it's a short season. So you really can't afford to be dropping points where you're expecting to be picking them up. Group stage of the Champions League, by the way, start tomorrow evening. If you had to give, say, for example, an Arsenal fan who won't have a horse in the race, a team to look out for or a team to get on the bandwagon of in this campaign, Rachel, who would you suggest? It's hard. I'm I'm excited to see, like, Paris FC. I think they've done so much damage. Uh, that might be hard for Arsenal fans to, to watch, given that's who knocked them out. But a team doing that kind of damage, knocking out Arsenal, knocking out Wolfsburg, in the same group as Chelsea, you know, they excite me. I'm really excited to see how they get on. I'm excited to see how they manage the group stages because, obviously, those two games they played felt a bit like cup final games. You could throw everything at it uh, and hopefully get the result. Um so I think, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see if they get on the group stages, but they're the ones I'm really looking forward to to watching. And obviously, we will be following Chelsea, of course. Um, Courtney Brosnan, not a great weekend for her. Conceded three. No, but I also think we saw, like, midweek in the Cup as well, how much Everton suffered when she's not there as well. Um, I think a lot of Everton's issues are more with their defensive setup fully than Courtney necessarily being the problem. There was like one or two where I thought her positioning could have been a bit better, but I don't think there was any like standout. It was an absolutely horrendous game for her. Or she made like any massive mistake. Okay. Anything else from an Irish perspective over the weekend? Uh, tough one for Megan Connolly. She own goal for Bristol. Uh, Heather Payne was back for Everton after being on the bench midweek. And then Izzy Atkinson also came on for West Ham. So great to see her getting more game time because she's been really impressive for them when she has played this season. All right. Rachel, we'll let you go. Good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. It's uh, Rachel Sullivan from Girls on the Ball.